My name's Ed Piskor. I'm Jim Rugg. Jim, we're going to take a look at one of these uh, weird oddities in 90s comics. Todd McFarlane, writer, artist, and colorist. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good one. Before we do that, though, man, some business to take care of. My newest comic, Octobriana 1976, the world's first blacklight comic, is now out in comic shops, available wherever comics, wherever you buy comics. And uh, we just got a big reorder from Diamond. So I think it's selling well. If you uh, missed the Kickstarter and you want to add this oddity to your comics collection, I recommend you do it sooner rather than later because we are burning through this print run very fast. Thank you all for that, by the way. Nothing better than, than selling out. So uh, we're heading that direction, but pick up October on in 1976 now. And if you're interested in the making of this, I have a 350 page PDF available on my website, jimrug.com, the process zine. It'll show you everything you want to know about how this comic was made. Patreon.com slash Ed Piscor, serializing the Red Room comic book, uh, my, future, my future series that should start coming out in uh, sort of mid-ish 2021. For early adopters, three bucks get you the archive. I post the imagery up there at a high enough resolution that you can make your own uh, bootleg <laughs> version of, uh, of Red Room. This that, stuff just speaks to my heart. <laughs> I love this. Yes. If you do make one, send me a copy. Send two. <laughs> it was a, uh, a four-page week this past week, Jimmy. So they look good. Three more pages of issue uh, four to go. Um, every issue, self-contained story. Also, tomorrow, going to be a big day at Sotheby's Auction House, man. The, uh, the first ever hip-hop auction at a big auction house is going down. And I have eight lots of artwork. Primo. That are best gonna of be the best. Some real good pieces, for sure, that are going to be up there uh, on auction and September 15th, Tuesday, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the hammers are going to start coming down, man. Uh, but this, the Ed Piscor Studio Edition, is the Buy Me Now option because all the artwork that's represented in the auction comes from this, uh, this PDF. When the auction house hit me up and was like, can, can we see examples of what your art looks like? I sent them a PDF of, uh, of this and just told them, make your choice, whatever you want, man. What's it worth? You make that decision, man. You know the bougie people. Like I said, best of the best. <laughs> Some choice pieces, man. That's really cool. Yeah, so that's going down tomorrow, 6 p.m. Matter at hand right now. Todd McFarlane, colorist. This is amazing. Uh, one of the most interesting Marvel colored comics I can think of. And coincidentally, another one is X-Force number four. So there might be something with that, with that number four uh, issue, but... This stuff looks wild. I, I don't know any other comic that looks like this comic. I'm not saying that's good or bad, but if you like different, add this one to your list. Todd McFarlane is the guy many people cite uh, as being the dude that gave them a call to say, you know what you need to do? You need to be the writer and the artist. Or be before that, you need to ink your own work, Ben, because you'll get double the royalties. Uh, so he's definitely trying to take another bite at the apple, telling Greg Wright, Take a powder for a hot minute. I got this on this issue. And uh, Colorist is one of his uh, duties that he decided to to perform. And goddamn. Yeah, that is a spread. <laughs> Jim, I ask you. Jim, I ask you. You know, in art theory, there's usually a focal point and And uh, design devices used to point you to the focal point. And often color can really highlight this the focal point, James. What's the focal point <laughs> of, of this two-page spread? This is one of the wildest two-page spreads I've ever seen. There is no focal point, man. This is like seizure-inducing in terms of so much happening. Uh, you think of color theory, as you say, Ed. Uh, it might be warm colors in the foreground, cool colors in the background, except for we have warm colors on Spider-Man and warm colors on Craven, and that is your foreground and background. And the lizard is just looking on with all kinds of stuff happening on him. This is a wild, wild... The whole issue is this way, but the two-page spread to me, this is where you just go, what in the hell is going on here? Now, I didn't look on the front cover, but I do want to point out this, this like... This head wound, right? <laughs> now let's let's just see if the paper tag is still in effect. It is, man. <laughs> get this get this at your shop and save. What is what is the comics code authority objecting to at this time period? Because like, come <laughs> on. 
We have an animated corpse with what looks like a massive gunshot wound to the head standing there. Huge two-page spread style. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> We're all all right. I wonder about McFarlane doing the coloring on this issue. Uh, he does some, some cool stuff. There's an issue that he letters later on, and, and someday we'll look at that probably. Is it... This is an artist who's just interested, right? Who's curious, who may be bored and wanting to try new things. I, I mean, I think it's trying to get dominion on, on everything. You know, like, what's better than, you know, three sets of ro royalties? Four. <laughs> it's pretty fun to see it. And I can't figure out, like, you know, you look at this stuff and you see, like, the highlights of the green, right, on this hand. Or, or you know, the highlights of the yellow added to that, like, move that motion lines. How are you cutting, you know, how are... These aren't being cut, the separations, right? Like they're they're drawing on the separations or something. I, I don't even know how you're making some of this stuff in terms of like the color separations, the poor person who's responsible for that. And I'd be curious to see the McFarlane color, you know, like like the layouts for these things, the color guides. It, it's, it's something I'm very unclear about when it comes to like this period of like 90s color. Because if you take a look, like the seps, it's not traditional like zip -a tone you can't you got to zoom in to see the dots that make up some of these like more rich colors and, and stuff so so i i'm at a loss i don't know um greg wright the guy who colors all the other pages he just added me on facebook so so like I'm, i'll ask him yeah i'd be curious to see it because we do see color guides now and then you'll see the steve olaf akira color guides if you go looking for them and they're amazing and beautiful but they're much more painted I've seen some that are like uh, almost crayons or color pencils. You know, it's just very quick to indicate where these colors go. I'd like to know what McFarlane's look like. Yeah, and like there are colors that are being used here that you don't see in your traditional, you know, Marvel or DC comic. Like this weird blue gray yeah. kind of color. That gray for a corpse is really a good one. We just got done looking at Will Eisner's uh, Comics and Sequential Art and talking about like panel borders setting the mood. McFarlane's using, man, every trick that, that he knows may be on display in this issue from from day one he was he was doing uh interesting panel compositions and stuff and, and you know like i have coyote number 11 we'll, we'll take a look at his his first professional works at some point as well and just a restless creator one of these guys you know he he's clearly an alpha male he'll, he'll push some ground like he'll tread territory that the average job guy just won't for fear of like losing their job this spread is a great example of just how far he's pushing it. Besides having highlights, and it's almost a hyperactive coloring style, which makes sense. I mean, I think his, his line work would be, you could describe the same way. But he's also doing things like, you know, that's a pretty good use, I think, for color theory is having your red in the foreground, your, your, your warm, hot color in the foreground, and then that desaturated background color that kind of reads. The alternative is when you get up to this uh, bird's eye view shot of the alleyway, and I mean, sorting this out is impossible. You've got yellows and grays both being like your your deep color or deep, you know, depth piece right next to each other. Yellows and grays, like the hottest and the coolest combination you could have. They're next to each other. There's white all over the place. Bizarre, really bizarre, strange choices. Yeah. I do wonder if part of coloring of this is trying to give the colorist some ideas as to like go for it, you know, like like push it further hit everything with a highlight on an edge or, you know, use more purples or something, you know, what, what's going on here? Cause it looks so different than the other issues. He definitely asked a lot of his creative teammates. Um, when you look at the spawn artist edition or vault edition, uh, you see a lot of notes all, all around, um, for the letterer and for the colorist is like indicators of like what they should have in mind whenever, um, you know, they're being trusted with doing their task. <laughs> this is another one of those <laughs> it's just like your crayon you just melted crayons and like blow dry the drips as they fall on the paper it's the instinct like when you're when you're a little kid and you get you know upgraded to the 64 color uh crayon box you gotta use them all i guess so i guess so. i'm glad he did i mean you know i, I mentioned the x-force 4 issue this really does stand out to me as being a unique looking comic for all these reasons. Um, I don't know that, you know, I think a lot of it is not successful, but wow, to look at it is, is it's incredible. It's incredible to think like you could do this. Um, maybe this isn't what you should have done, but think of the things between this and your standard Marvel comic at the time. Like there's so much more that people could have been doing and you see, you kind of see it. You see what is available here. I'm, 
I like, you know, everybody dogs on McFarlane's writing, including himself, but I'll take a hundred issues of a writer artist driven comic, no matter what it is, than like your standard assembly line, regular ass comic. That's just like, you're looking at that blue on that flesh. <laughs> I'm looking at a lot. <laughs> Uh, th this is this is Mary Jane, a fashion model, out uh, clubbing at, at Hypno Love Will. This is this is the club scene. McFarlane's envisioning. <laughs> I feel like uh, you know I, I was watching Spring Break, uh, MTV Spring Break or something. It is a thousand years away from what we're seeing here. Is is McFarlane's uh, club idea? What do you say, man? There's a disco ball, <laughs> right? And it looks like the wharf where Rorschach is about to bend someone's <laughs> right, fingers right, back. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this is the neighborhood. This is uh, Pete and Mary Jane's like neighborhood local bar here. Yeah, and it, sell it even further with like you know, ninety percent of the people that you see have like gray hair. <laughs> <laughs> the use of gray as a color in this issue is is uh, shocking. You know, and just like little white cheek highlight around there. That the white is so bright. You know, when he uses that as a highlight, it is just so um, almost an alien color compared to like all the colored parts. You know, that uncolored piece of white just glares off the page. That's a powerful color to use. And he uses it a lot. And this is also like that thing that you do when you get your 64 color crayon box. It's like you take the time to like make each little bead its own color when, you know, like anybody else would just wash and then some stuff on top. Check out this tangent for Spider-Man's head going into the teeth. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's kind of a perfect tangent of that head. I right. can't decide if I love that or not. <laughs> it's fun to look at this stuff, man. Good, uh, good, bad, or whatever. It's just incredible. We got more blue on like the brown of Callista's face. I kind of like that. That, that blue, that turquoisey green blue, don't see that color very often either. No, and and you could like see it's like hundred percent plates. Like there's, I don't think that's drawn. I think that's like what do they call it? like a like a flare, like a lens flare or something like with a sliding plate, uh, right there. Like you. This page seems a little more sound. So okay. all of your all of your panels are these purples and and kind of muted grays, tans. And then framed by, by the uh, by the more full color, Callisto, Calypso, 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 yeah. Calypso. Uh, this feels very inspired to me by like like a Sam Keith, like Sandman, era comic, and a lot of what McFarlane was doing creatively, um, was was pulling from that, giving characters their own kind of dialogue balloons and dialogue bubbles. Uh, the florid prose um, that would show up in these captions, difference being uh, Neil Gaiman read his entire you know high school library by the time he was in eighth grade. <laughs> right. And Todd McFarlane admits to not reading the, uh, the sports page. The, the flip side is McFarlane's doing it almost visually. So you see things like silhouettes, you know, like from a visual standpoint, he's pulling out all kinds of stops, yeah. um, which is great to see. Obviously, a difference between his his writing and, and reading and his art, uh, not necessarily a bad thing again, but a very different approach than comparing it to Neil Gaiman. Right. Another one of these wild uh, spreads of color, where we have the purple on the green, and that's a very deep green, hundred percent plates on that. You could almost feel the ink on the page. Yeah, that's where you see your color theory really struggling. Where he's he's putting these complementary colors next to each other, but then throw in the oranges in the background, which is even popping more. Like it's really like this dissonance of all these colors fighting with each other. Sometimes it kind of works. You know, I think this blue center panel is framed by a lot of the, the warm oranges around it kind of works, but then you get a panel like this and it's just like, you know what, let's go back to colors fighting each other. And even more so here with your greens and orange on the same hand, like that orange is popping and that green's receding. And they're on the same hand, like they're touching. It's it's a piece that's literally at the same depth, and just like one's racing forward and one's going back. The orange highlight against the the red Spider Man mask, it's it's bizarre. Yeah, really fun to look at. One of these like it, it, this doesn't happen. This doesn't get to happen if you don't sell two point five million comics. Yeah. So you so you know they throw up their hands and they say yeah Todd, 
like co- go ahead uh this is issue four so so it's it's the numbers are in on issue one you know what i'm saying man so like they he has his buying temperature is very high in the psych- psychology of sales. Yeah, I mean, this would be probably Marvel's highest selling comic for, yeah. for the last four months. You know, this is before X-Force and X-Men show up. This would have been, if not their top, definitely in their top three. And uh, you do get to do whatever you want, I think. But I'm under the impression there's tension between he and the editor. Uh, cer- cer- some of it's kayfabe in the letter column, maybe. But I think there's tension. And I mean, if you're an editor and you get this, you sort of have to sign and be like, it's... This is what Todd wants. This is what Todd gets. But if you're, this is my first color job, you're out the door. Someone else is is coloring this. You're not coloring anything else. <laughs> you're fired. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's. I, I mean, that's what I love. This is my favorite kind of stuff in comics. Like, I would much rather see this than whatever the standard by the numbers look is. Right. <laughs> Last page, a pretty competent explosion. It is. It's it's a it's a great page for. Uh, it sums up all of the coloring throughout this issue. It does, and I'll tell you, uh, there's there's one stroke that sums it up perfectly, and it's just this like one little slab of green. Like it's the only time green <laughs> shows up on the whole page, and it's just right there. Todd, can we get the color guides? Yeah, please, can please we, share those. Can we please see these color guides? I'm begging man. for those things. And I'll I'll, uh, I'll see your green and say there's another spot where we get to see the epitome of the coloring. It's where this rectangle can't even be the same color. <laughs> Come on, man. People get bored by the end of that light blue. We got we to gotta switch it up. Add some excitement in that part five box. <laughs> uh, the white makes sense here. It does, yeah. I, it's a hot color. It should be the heart of the explosion. That's a great use of white. Yeah, man, I, I dig it. This is this is as wild as you're going to find, I think, in a Marvel color job. Pretty cool. I've been um, looking at lurid paperback covers and exploitation movie uh, posters and stuff to, to try to figure out, like, the color palette for, for, for my Red Room comics and stuff. I got to go in that direction. Uh, one of the lessons that I learned from, like, the great Bas- Basil Gogos, famous Monsters of the Filmland, places like that, is, like, it is possible to use every color in the crayon box, you know, like all, all the, you know, primary colors. You could use them all, but there's a way to do it. Uh, I like to see, you know, this this version. It's fun. It's like, you know, Alpha and Omega, Basil Gogos, Todd McFarlane. It's, uh, it's an example. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get out of here, Jimmy. That's all I have. Okay, Fabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when the next vids are available. Uh, we're on the race to 30,000 subscribers, so make sure you go ahead and do that. Octobriana, selling out quick. In stores now, though. Make sure you get that comic as ASAP, because you're going to regret it when it costs $50 on eBay. Patreon.com slash Ed is where Red Room is being serialized. Three bucks sketch of the archive. And uh, tomorrow, Tuesday... September 15th, Sotheby's Auction House, uh, Hip Hop Family Tree artwork is 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 on the block, man, and the hammer starts coming down 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can find Cartoonist Kayfabe merchandise and t-shirts at the links below this video. And uh, commentators out there, did you find Felix the Cat in this issue? <laughs> because I looked and looked and did not. So post post the page where Felix the Cat appears if you if, if he is indeed in this issue. That's not a bad marching order to give them, Jim. But give them one more. Read more comics.